Welcome back to our study of 2 Kings. After taking a significant break, we are returning to 2 Kings and picking up our study in chapter 12. You might remember that in 2 Kings chapter 11, Jehoash became king when he was just seven years old. It was a fascinating story of how that came to pass. But in chapter 12, we're going to see the reign of Joash and what happened uh, during his time as king. So let's pick it up. Second Kings chapter 12, beginning of verse 1. It says, In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba, and Jehoash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days, because Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people continued to sacrifice and make offerings on the high places. Now let's pause there and notice what this brief summary right here at the beginning tells us about uh, Joash's reign. Right? You see his name here spelled Jehoash. It's, just the, it's the same name, same person. He reigned for 40 years. Remember, he began to reign when he was just seven years old. He reigned for 40 years. And he was a good king, right? Verse 2 says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days. So his whole life, he was doing the things that pleased God. He was a good king. And we're told why it was that he was a good king, why he did what God wanted him to do all the days of his life. In the second half of the verse, because Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Now remember, for a king of Judah or a king of Israel... It was not enough simply for them to be uh, a king who was wise in the ways of, of governing, of knowing how to, to manage people and manage money and, and deal with um, military issues and things like that. This king needed to know the word and ways of God. He needed to know God's law. He needed to do what God said. He needed to believe what God said and act on what God said. And so it was important uh, for the king to walk in God's ways. And Jehoiada, it just tells us here that he instructed, Jehoiada the priest instructed Joash the king. But I think we're meant to uh, draw the conclusion from that, that at least part of, if not the main part of what Jehoiada was instructing Joash in, was in the word of God, that he told him what God said, what God expected of the king, what God expected of his people, how he was to govern according to God's word and God's way. So he was a good king because he had a, a priest to instruct him, to teach him, uh, to help him to know what it is that he should do. But not everything was as it should have been uh, in Jehoash's reign, in Joash's reign, even though he was a good king. Verse 3 says, Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people continued to sacrifice and make offerings on the high places. Now, these high places are mentioned multiple times in Scripture. It's not always clear what's going on there. In this case, it's not uh, clear what's going on there. One of two things could be happening. Neither one of them are good, but one of them is worse than the other. Best case scenario, the people are worshiping God, offering sacrifices to God at these high places, even though God has told them to worship at the temple. Right? So that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, they're actually worshiping other gods, false gods, idols at these high places and not worshiping the true God at all. Either way, it's not a good situation and uh, it continued to take place during the reign of Jehoash, even though he was a good king who honored the Lord. Now let's keep going. Verse 4. Jehoash said to the priests, All the money of the holy things that is brought into the house of the Lord, the money for which each man is assessed, the money from the assessment of persons, and the money that a man's heart prompts him to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take each from his donor and let them repair the house wherever any need of repairs is discovered. But by the 23rd year of King Jehoash, the priests had made no repairs on the house. Therefore, King Jehoash summoned Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them, Why are you not repairing the house? Now, therefore, take no more money from your donors, but hand it over for the repair of the house. So the priests agreed that they should take no more money from the people and that they should not repair the house. Then Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it 
and set it beside the altar on the right side as one entered the house of the Lord. And the priests who guarded the threshold put in it all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. And whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, the king's secretary and the high priest came up and they bagged and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. Then they would give the money that was weighed out into the hands of the workmen who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they paid it out to the carpenters and the builders who worked on the house of the Lord and to the masons and the stone cutters, as well as to buy timber and quarried stone for making repairs on the house of the Lord and for any outlay for the repairs of the house. But there were not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver, snuffers, bowls, trumpets, or any vessels of gold or of silver from the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, for that was given to the workmen who were repairing the house of the Lord with it. And they did not ask for, accounting, for an accounting from the men into whose hand they delivered the money to pay out to the workmen, for they dealt honestly. The money from the guilt offerings and the money from the sin offerings was not brought into the house of the Lord. It belonged to the priests. Okay, now that's a long passage, but let's stop there. And there's really just one main thing I want you to notice from those group of verses. And that is that Joash was concerned with the house of the Lord. He gave instructions for the temple to be repaired, for it to be taken care of, right? For those things that uh, needed to be addressed, right? With the, the temple building to be fixed, to be repaired, to be taken care of. Now he gave that instruction to the priests and yet it didn't happen. And at some point he realized it wasn't happening and he confronted the priests about it. And long story short, right? It ended up getting fixed. They ended up taking care of it. They instituted a, a way of these offerings being collected and they were distributed to the right persons so that the temple could be repaired, so that the temple could be kept uh, kept up, right? Uh, and so the reason why this is important to note is because all the way back to King David, right? King David was the one who had it in his heart to build a temple for the Lord. Up to that point, the Lord dwelt in the tabernacle, but David had it in his heart, the scripture says, to build a house for the Lord. Of course, David was not allowed to, but David's son Solomon built the temple that is now being repaired in Jehoash's day, right? Jehoash's day. And um, when Jesus comes as the true temple, right? He's the dwelling place of God because he is God, right? Dwelling on earth as man. He's the God man. Uh, Jesus, when he uh, cleansed the temple in John chapter 2, uh, it says the disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me, right? A, a passion for your temple, right, will consume me. And so we see this not only in David, but also in a sense in Solomon and here in Joash, all of these men pointing forward to Jesus, who would not only be the true fulfillment of the temple, but would, who would have a greater commitment and passion for the temple even than these men did. Right? But all of these men in their concern uh, for the temple, in their passion for the temple, were in their own ways pointing forward to Jesus, who was the true temple, right? And the one who was most concerned with the temple. Uh, and so we see even a, a pointer to Christ here in Joash's concern for the temple of God. This is the dwelling place of God. It needs to be kept in good repair. Right? That was Joash's concern. All right, next, verse 17. At that time, Hazael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. But when Hazael set his face to go up against Jerusalem, Jehoash, king of Judah, took all the sacred gifts that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his fathers, the kings of Judah, had dedicated, and his own sacred gifts, and all the gold that was found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house, and sent, those, uh, sent these to Hazael, king of Syria. Then Hazael went away from Jerusalem. Now, in one sense, you can read that and say, well, uh, it may not sound good, but at least it worked, right? That uh, the king gave away these items from uh, the treasury of the house of the Lord, but at least it, you know, that doesn't sound like a good thing, but at least that meant Hazael, king of Syria, 
left and left them alone, but there's more going on here than this. And here's a, a comment that I found in the, the commentary by Dale Ralph Davis that was really helpful uh, to me for understanding what's, what's happening in this moment. I think he's exactly right. He's commenting on this moment and others as well. And he says, all these are but previews of what the Babylonians will do. In other words, he's saying this is just a hint of the coming exile and destruction of the temple. And this part's not exactly pointing to the exile, but when the Babylonians take uh, Judah into exile, they're also going to destroy and plunder the temple. And in a sense, uh, Davis is saying that's what's happening here. That This is sort of a minor plundering of the temple, except it's voluntary, right? The king is giving up, I mean, under some duress, but uh, the uh, king of Syria is not coming and taking these things by force, but under the threat of force, the king of Judah is giving these things away to the king of Syria. And again, as Davis points out, it's just pointing forward to where Second Kings is going to end, which is with the destruction of the temple and uh, the exile of Judah under the Babylonians. So finally, we read of the end of uh, Joash's life. It says, now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? His servants arose and made a conspiracy and struck down Joash in the house of Milo on the way that goes down to Silla. It was Jazakar, the son of Shemaeth, and Jehozabad, the son of Shomer, his servants, who struck him down so that he died. And they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. So not a great ending to Joash's story, but uh, there's not really a great ending to the book of 2 Kings either. We've got at least two strands, uh, two themes running through here that are leading us on to the conclusion of the book, right? One, of course, we just mentioned the approaching exile. We know that that's what's coming at the end of the story, that the Babylonians will destroy the temple and uh, carry away the people of Judah into exile. But we also have in this story a pointer to the coming Messiah. Remember that God promised David that a king would come from his line and sit on his throne and he would reign forever, right? And we see another pointer, another hint of that coming king in Joash, who had this passion for the temple, this concern for the temple, which again would ultimately uh, be seen in Jesus himself, the Messiah. But also we see uh, at the beginning here, the people worshiping at these high places, again, possibly idolatry, possibly just worshiping away from the temple instead of at the temple like they were supposed to. Um, but again, things are not as they should be. And um, eventually, because of Israel's sin, they're going to be taken away into this exile, which is just a reminder that they need this Messiah. They need the Savior, just like you and I. We continue to sin, right? We uh, fall short of God's standard. We fall short of the glory of God. We also need the Messiah. We need Jesus. Praise God that he came. Jesus himself, the Son of God, who became the Son of Man, the Word of God, who became flesh, as John puts it, and dwelt among us, and who offered the ultimate sacrifice, who took our place, took our sin, died and was raised, that we might be forgiven and have life with God. We give thanks to him. God bless.